in 15 years. Banks have been doing a quite a lot of things in their risk management with regard to Basel and even with regard to the ORRs and, uh, and, the, and the stress testing scenarios they have developed. So not all banks but quite a few banks have capacity in maybe not in the, in, not in the account and uh, their CFO office but in their CRO office. They have that uh, capacity. So it's not impossible to build. But I think the impossibility will, or I would say not say impossibility, but the difficulty will come what they will do uh, organizationally or culturally with them themselves. Because I don't know what kind of relationship generally exists between the CRO office and the CFO office, and for that matter, business office. So uh, they, if, you are, if, if you are going to rely a lot on what your uh, risk guy is saying, it's, it's actually going to impact your bottom line now. It's not like a standalone thing that he churn up some numbers and impresses everybody with his mathematical knowledge. But that, that is going to impact your bottom line. So th how, how that is going to get reconciled within the bank is another challenge, of course. So it's, yes, you can develop the models, but are you willing? Are the top management willings? to really use it for their, uh, for their financial reporting. Again, I don't know. Everybody will have a different way. And what we have seen with banks, it a lot depends on what the top is like. Banks who are good in their risk management are not only good because they have got a good risk management team. They are good because their CEO and even the board members, the risk management committee of the board is very active and very, uh, I would say, demanding of them. So that's why they are good. And the banks where they don't have that, so if they can have maybe great guys working in the risk management department, uh, they don't do much. In fact, they, if, over the years, they lose those talent also to other banks. So I think there are challenges. But uh, my personal view is that we would have to eventually go on to IFRS 9, uh, maybe in a phase banner, maybe, maybe some simplified version, maybe d uh, designed by, by the auditors for countries like us, I'm not sure. But we have to go into that direction, but keeping in view all our challenges in mind. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, Actually, uh, from this, I actually remember a movie uh, which is basically too big to fail. So uh, I think IFRS 9 is more prudent what uh, prudential regulations right, uh, right now are. And if you look at the European Union, I think the latest, uh, uh, the latest records are available on the website. And it says that the provision requirement would actually increase by 50%. If you compare 39 with IFRS 9, the provisioning requirement would increase by, the, by 50%. And technically, this will come in your financial statements in the sense that because in the company, it will be applied. And in the company, if you look at the debtors, it, it says that it should be applied to the, as a lifetime theory. So it, in the company's PNL, it will come as a charge. And obviously, the company's investment will be there in the balance sheet of the banks. And obviously, that will affect the balance sheet of the banks indirectly. So I think it's time that uh, in the company as well as in the banks, it should apply simultaneously, simultaneously with a guidelines from the State, of, State Bank of Pakistan, if possible, so that it can be done very easily. 50, 5 0, 5 0 percent, yeah. Uh, let me uh, invite uh, Mr. Faranullah Khan, CFO Light Bank, to present challenges which the bank might face. Asalaamu Alaikum. Uh, First of all, I would like to thank uh, President ICAP, uh, Southern Regional Committee, for inviting me uh, for this very important session. Uh, and I would like to also uh, appreciate the very nice presentations uh, given by Arslan Numan and uh, uh, a very uh, broad view given by uh, Ms. Lubna. Uh, before we go into the detail of IFRS 9, I want to uh, you know, take the audience to a bigger picture. I think, uh, first of all, I beg to defer with my learned colleagues. I'm also a chartered accountant, but now since the last 18 years, I'm a banker, so I've put on the banker uh, cap today. 
I don't think, frankly speaking, that IS-39 is the only reason for the financial crisis that happened. Uh, research and numerous case studies, uh, you know, uh, show that it was a systemic failure. And um, it was basically driven by pure greed of the Wall Street. If you securitize subprime mortgages knowingly that they will default and spin it out of your balance sheet and sell it to unsuspecting uh, investors, including pension funds, and give, get them uh, a very high credit rating. Uh, I don't think IS-39, IFRS-9, IFRS-59, uh, IFRS-109, nothing can stop that. That was driven by pure greed. So number one. Now, coming back to what they have come up, because it was a knee-jerk reaction. A lot of things have happened in the Western world. Uh, first, they were sleeping. Now, they have become hyperactive. Now, IFRS 9 implementation, I mean, I've gone digital, so I've made the notes in my mobile phone. Uh, if we look at the uh, Western economy status today, everybody pays tax. The entire economy is documented. The entire spectrum of industries is documented, data is available. People are willing to provide information and the access to information is easily available. And um, when we compare the situation in Pakistan, one million tax filers out of a population of 200 million. And we have to look at the overall balance sheet composition of Pakistani banking sector as well. Right now, the ADR is hovering around 46%. I think in the Western world, this, the private sector credit appetite is much higher. And I humbly, humbly, humbly beg to differ with my learned colleagues Aslan and with Ms. Lubna as well that banks are primarily to blame for the lack of credit growth in the country. Do we actually have private sector credit appetite? Is lack of excess of credit availability the only reason that credit is not growing? I don't think so. There are bigger issues in the economy. There is security issue, there is lack of power, there is, um, you know, uh, the whole economy, including the manufacturing sector, especially on the commercial side, is, in a, is facing a huge challenge. And now with CPAC, I think this challenge is going to increase manifold because our cost of manufacturing is not comparable because our input cost, whether it's energy, whether it's uh, labor, it's all not comparable to the international world. So primarily, there, ha there has been a paradigm shift in 2016 in the banking philosophy as well. Yes, banks, because of the lack of private sector appetite, were um, on no choice basis, uh, they were investing in government securities and yes, there was a small window where there was high yield government securities available as well and bulk of them have matured in 2016. So 2017 onwards you will see a significant change in the overall dynamics of banking profitability as well. Banks, you know, if you give a banker an option today to lend uh, on, a, on a commercial loan where the pricing is K plus even one, you know, K1, compared to a T-bill, I would think every banker would want to give a loan because the yields on government securities are too low. Even our intermediation cost, incremental intermediation cost is not going to be covered. So definitely, all banks are, um, they are already, you know, changing their philosophy. They are becoming more aggressive, but they are at the end dependent on the doc documentation that is being given to them. So this is also a major challenge. We can't just you know, look at the um, implementation of IFRS 9 from technical perspective. The major challenge, you know, is uh, driven towards the obligors themselves. And if we look at the, uh, as Lubna was telling us that, you know, our NPL portfolio, uh, the NPL ratio in the industry, it was, I think, in the mid-15% range in 2000, uh, 2008 and 2009. It has come down to 11%. The NPL coverage, uh, which Lubna mentioned as an industry, if you look at the large five banks, it's 
90 percent of the provisioning is covered by loans and I think that uh, when Amin was uh, you know making the bankers uh, very jittery with 50 percent additional provisioning he has to understand that that research is driven by Western economies and Western banks where ADRs are more than 50, uh, mo you know they are higher than the reserve ratio because th there is a concept of interbank borrowing as well uh, like uh, a large bank in India has an ADR of 101 percent ICICI bank has they are lending more than their deposits because they are borrowing hugely from the interbank so uh, I think that uh, this is not a very, very simple case. We cannot be, yet at the same time, we cannot be out of the international global framework. But we have to think first for Pakistan. And I think that in Pakistan, uh, job creation is a major issue. And unless we, you know, facilitate and encourage credit expansion, we, uh, we will be facing much bigger problems. And uh, as Aslan and Numan were mentioning that IFRS 9 is uh, geared towards incremental, small, smaller provisioning, but incremental provisioning for uh, as you expand your credit book. That is, uh, that is how it's been uh, structured. Um, so I think that would be a, a, a major challenge. And um, my view is that uh, we, I agree with Lumna that since we cannot be out of the market and I don't foresee any major hit on our balance sheet even for the large banks especially so we should go for it but in a phased manner while giving priority to and being realistic about local perspective so this is why I take on it yeah I totally agree uh, but I just want to add something you just said CPAC so CPAC is basically a game changer for Pakistan and I think if you look at the company's ordinance uh, 2016, it also allows that you can prepare IFRS financial statement. It is applicable on companies, not on banks. But I think things are changing and it, in, in a very fast way. Just like if you see a road, it's like it's a club road, they just made it in one day. So in Pakistan, I have never seen a road which was made in one day. So I think things are changing like anything. And there's an article also that in 2030, there'll be banks but without branches. So you won't see any branches in banks. So, you know, the, the, the banking system, everything is changing. It's, it's coming on, on, on your cell phone, and you, you're just using your cell phone to just uh, uh, make a deliver something to the audience. So I think uh, this IFRS is technically a game changer, and I think positively, obviously in a phase manner, we should adopt it, and it can be done as a, as a parallel system. Let's see, let's do an impact analysis that what will be the impact on Pakistan economy, because uh, if you don't adopt now, you will be required to adopt because the China's, China economy and Russia, you know, like everybody is coming to Pakistan right now. <clears throat> so we are in the center of all the location and we are very attractive location. So if these people are coming in and then obviously at that time we will be required to adopt IFRS 9. So let's start a Q&A session and I have few questions but I think uh, the time is not there so I'll, I'll give the opportunity to the to everyone, like if uh, somebody wants to ask any question on IFRS 9 or something like anything on that. Please share your name and the uh, organization, please. Ji, Assalamu alaikum. My name is Kashif Ahmed and I am the Chief Compliance Officer of MCB Islamic Bank. Uh, my question is to Arsalan. Uh, you mentioned in your presentation that uh, for non-trading investment, uh, uh, non-trading securities, uh, there is at the time of purchase there is an option available with the entity to basically recognize, transfer the difference in fair value added to the profit and loss account or to uh, uh, OCI. So what I understand is that um, for in an entity there would be a two portfolios because not every because at the time of purchase not necessarily every investment is uh, OIC or uh, uh, is classified as transferred to the OCI or to the profit and loss. So I assume that there, there would be two portfolios. Um, my question is that. If there are two portfolios, 
I think that if it's allowed, then for the investments where the difference is parked to the OIC, uh, what, be, what would be the tax impact? Because you have mentioned that once the, the difference is parked to that particular OIC, then at the time of disposal also, the, the income goes to that specific account and not to the profit and loss account. So of course, there would be a, basically a taxation impact also. Well, I, I am, uh, I am not an expert in tax, but I think I can, I can uh, give you a broad answer. You know, as per the taxation in Pakistan for banks, I think the total income is taxed as per the, as appearing in the accounts. I think that's the phrase used in the schedule. Yeah, yeah. And the total income means uh, also elements of the comprehensive income. So if actually you have uh, unrealized gains sitting in the comprehensive income from investments, which will now never be cycled to the PNL account. So as per the, uh, the tax law, the, if the total income has to be taxed as appearing in the accounts of a banking company, then the total income should include this, this, this element of the comprehensive income. But, uh, but that is a, I, I would caution you, that's not a tax advice. <laughs> Please, I think uh, Shabbat Sahib is, I think, can highlight it. When, when we drafted the, uh uh, seventh schedule to the company's uh, to the income tax ordinance, we had made a special provision. And if you look at the seventh schedule, we have special provision that any adjustment arising on this uh, IS 39 will not be considered for taxable purposes. This was the underlying theme of the seventh schedule at that time. Now, we, once, once this IS, IFRS 9 is applied, then a policy decision has to be taken by the FBR. What they, how do they want to? to go about it because uh, uh, we have to realize one very important thing that tax is a cash tax is a cash item yes <laughs> this is a cash item I, I think uh, unlike I, I, unlike accounting tax is a cash item <laughs> and uh, we cannot uh, look in the on we, can, we, can, we cannot float around in the accrual concept without cash being income or uh, or receipts so uh, so these these are the important consideration, and we have to look into that. I think I think there's the best. I, I think w one of the considerations which we have not discussed as yet is the tax, because if you do the IFRS nine accounting and you increase your provisions based on the expected loss model, whether the tax department will.